Hello fellow researchers, scientists, family, and friends. Welcome. We are the ISAT-2 group measuring sea ice extent utilizing altimetry. Hello, my name is Ahmed Deep, and I am a junior from Ormond Beach, Florida. My hobbies include playing basketball and volleyball, taking pictures, as well as listening to music. My future aspirations include entering the medical field one day, as well as continuing conducting climate research. Hi, I'm Spence Cox, and I'm a senior from Charleston, South Carolina, where I enjoy kayaking and playing ultimate frisbee. I'm passionate about climate re research and renewable energy development, and I hope to become a mechanical engineer in these fields. Hello, my name is Ayushi Kashyap, and I'm a senior from Fremont, California, where in my free time, I enjoy biking, reading, and exploring the outdoors. I also enjoy exploring the intersection between data analysis and climate science, as well as how Earth's processes shape our world. In the future, I aspire to work in the data science field. Our research question for our research is evaluating the association between ice at 2 derived sea ice thickness and freeboard with penguin populations in Cape Washington, Antarctica. The satellite that we focused our research on is ISAT-2, which stands for Ice, Cloud, and Land Elevation Satellite. Its launch date was September 15 in 2018, and its satellite mission is to use its onboard laser altimetry system to measure developments in the cryosphere. This is super important because this allows scientists to develop alternative or sustainable solutions. On board of ISAT-2, it carries a singular LIDAR instrument, which is known as ATLAS. It fires six photon beams, three weak and three strong, and two products that we specifically focused on in our research is ATL-7, which focuses on sea ice height as well as open water leads, as well as ATL-10, which focuses on estimates of sea ice freeboard. In figure one is the ISAT-2 satellite in orbit, as well as in figure two, it represents the pulses of light that goes through mirrors and lenses. They grow through this process before hitting the ground to ensure that the timing, size, and position is perfect, and it is split up into six beams. In figure three is a Virion telescope, which is shown with the addition of the laser reference system, which serves as a steering device with the overall purpose of catching photons. We extensively used the Landsat 8 satellite, the eighth in the program, as two main instruments. The operational land imager, which has nine bands in the shortwave infrared and visible imagery, and the thermal infrared sensor, which has two bands of thermal data. The following table compares both satellite systems that we mainly use in our research, which are ISAT-2 as well as Landsat 8. ISAT-2 is a LiDAR altimeter with a spatial resolution of 70 centimeters, as well as a temporal resolution of 91 days. Landsat-8 has two types, a visible and thermal sensor. For visible, it has 15 meters of panchromatic bands, as well as 30 meters of the rest of the bands. And the thermal sensor has a 100 meter spatial resolution. Its temporal resolution is 16 days. And how we used both of these satellite systems was for ISAT-2, we used it to calculate the sea ice height and thickness. And for Landsat-8, we used it to quantify the sea ice area. There has been high fluctuation in Antarctic sea ice extent. However, it has grown in the past 40 years, but there has been an extreme low in 2017. The Emperor St. Penguins heavily rely on the sea ice for a breeding ground and to support krill populations, which is the base of the food chain. However, climate change models predict that all Emperor Penguin populations will be quasi-extinct by 2100. The colony we chose to study was Cape Washington, located in Antarctica. The longitude is 165.42 degrees, and the latitude is negative 74.65 degrees. Some of our goals with this research project is to 1. Predict the future penguin population of Cape Washington, as well as unearth the association between sea ice volume and penguin population, and finally, on a global scale, analyze and predict the sea ice changes in the Antarctic region. The global climate crisis poses a serious threat to mankind, species loss, and habitat destruction. Antarctica has seen significant influence from this, 
as the poles are affected more than any other place on Earth. The d decrease in sea ice has a great effect on the animals present in this area. The research objective is to measure the changes of sea ice thickness as well as sea ice freeboard through the utilization of ISAT-2 and how it affects emperor penguin colonies in Cape Washington. As you know, sea ice melting has burdened the scientific world for a long time due to its adverse effects. So we hope that our research will allow us to make connections and discover when sea ice thickness in freeboard is at its highest. And with this, we can better understand what we need to do to help maintain these conditions. The dates we chose to research in this study include two dates from each month, October, November, and December from 2018, 2019, and 2020 from the ISAT-2 and Landsat-8 satellites. The reason we chose these dates are because it's during the spring season in the Antarctic region, meaning that the sea ice has, is at its highest, as well as it being the emperor penguin's hunting season. Our hypothesis is that as a result of the greenhouse effect, greenhouse gases trap sunlight in the atmosphere, causing higher global temperatures. And respectively, we hypothesize that there will be a decline in the sea ice thickness and freeboard due to the absorption of solar radiation. Therefore, the emperor penguin colony in Cape Washington will decrease due to the declining sea ice, which leads to a diminishing food source and loss of habitat. It's important to understand the true extent of sea ice. While just the freeboard is shown, or the part above the top of the water, sea ice often extends far below this because of the interaction of ice and water. Below are two images from Cape Washington, Antarctica. These images were taken both on October 25th. The one on the left-hand side is from 2018, as well as the one on the right-hand side is from 2019. Um, just for a little background, we couldn't use the images to its full capacity due to the images not intersecting correctly. Therefore, we used QGIS as a platform of founding, finding the overlay as well as the intersection between two images. Next to the images, we have a short animation of a one-year lapse to see the sea ice change. As we can see on the northwest side, we can see that there the water mass is decreased from 2018 to 2019, as well as there is a buildup of sea ice extent. Therefore, this serves as evidence that there was a sea ice buildup from the years 2018 through 2019. We will now be talking about the way we acquired, extracted, and processed our data, as well as the overall methods of our project. We use Python for scripting and QGIS as a free software for classification and visualization. We use the read ISAT2 package to find the sea ice height and pandas and matplotlib for data processing and plotting. We pulled the best tracks from the National Snow and Ice Data Center by selecting the correct coordinates and times. We pulled these files into Open Altimetry to check for ATL 10 points. And then we chose the correct tracks from October to December from 2018 to 2020. In order to extract the data, we use multiple Python packages, but most specifically, we use the ATL07 and ATL10 ISAT2 packages created by the science team. We sampled specific data attributes to process these. On the right, we have an example of some of the packages that we imported, such as matplotlib, pandas, and as well as the ISAT2 toolkit. This is the full code from our extraction script, which read in the ATL10 file and extracted the attributes listed in the middle in green. On Python 3, we used the package read isat2 to obtain the sea ice heights and to process the H5 files. The package has a variety of scripts that are used to read the ATL beams and files, and it converts the beams to formats. It's also used to create all of the masks. This is our full code to process the already extracted data. It includes parts to cut the data shorter based on the latitude of the data products, as well as filtering through the uh, based on some factors such as null values, and then converting the freeboard height to sea thick, sea ice thickness based on the formula. 
The attributes that we chose to analyze and extract included the latitude, longitude, height segment height, beam height, and much more. The geolocation data was provided by the latitude and longitude coordinates. The height segment height attribute provided the geolocated and absolute height of the freeboard data. The height segment confidence provided us the confidence interval to corroborate the accuracy of the data. The height segment type attribute provided us information about the type of sea ice. And the height segment flag attribute provided us information of whether the freeboard data was the ice level or the sea level. And arguably the most important attribute, the beam height attribute. It provided us with the freeboard height of the sea ice. In order to process the data, we cut the data to restrict all of it to a specific range of latitudes based on where the beams travel in the area. We figured this out through the Open Altimetry website. From that, we specifically took the beam FB height attribute from the ex extracted data CSV and modified this freeboard height to calculate the sea ice thickness. The original data contained multiple values that were null and, and were represented by an abnormally large number, so we filtered through those to remove them from the file. The top screenshot shows the cutting uh, down of the data based on the latitudes, and the bottom uh, screenshot shows the uh, modifying of the freeboard height to calculate the sea ice thickness. In order to calculate the sea ice thickness, we explored a variety of methods. The one we settled on is the sea ice thickness equation that takes into account the difference in density between seawater and ice in order to calculate the sea ice thickness below the water's surface as well as above the surface. This equation is h sub i, which is the sea ice thickness that we want to find, which is equal to rho sub w, which is the density of seawater, over rho sub w again, minus rho sub i, which is the density of ice, multiplied by h sub f, the freeboard height extracted from the beams. The coefficient of the freeboard height density ratio came out to be equal to 9.9029, which we hard coded into our script. In result, we cycled through the extracted freeboard heights to create a new data column containing the sea ice thickness. On average, the sea ice thickness over the three years, 2018, 2019, and 2020, did vary by a bit, but not by a whole amount, trending at around two to three meters thick. The graphs below show the sea ice thickness over time. We utilized three years, 2018, 2019, and 2020. So let's go ahead and look at the graphs. During 2018, the sea ice thickness was relatively steady, and this is actually the only year that the trend line was increasing. During 2019, we see a massive increase in the beginning of October with a massive decrease in the middle of October, as well as a increase at the end of December, but later on in 2020, there is a large decrease in early October. And during 2020, in the middle of October, we see a uh, large increase in sea ice thickness and it decreases in the middle of November. And the trend lines for 2018 and 2020 are decreasing. Listed below, we have two graphics analyzing a comparison between two years. On the left hand side, we have a graph showing sea ice thickness over the years of 2018 through 2019. On the right hand side, we have a comparison of sea ice thickness for 2019 through 2020. By analyzing these graphs on the left hand side, we see our lowest point of sea ice thickness between the two years happens during early November in 2019, with our highest point of sea ice thickness also in 2019 during early October. When we shift gears to 2019 and 2020, we see that our highest point is during 2019 and early October, with our lowest point in early October for the year of 2020. Um, analyzing these graphs, we see that there is a bit of a trend between the Antarctic sp spring months. Um, in early October, we see a massive decrease of sea ice thickness where it stays relatively steady until December where we see an increase. However, surprisingly, in the year of 2020, we see a delay and sea ice thickness doesn't increase in the months of December, it actually decreases. Here we show a graph of the sea ice thickness from 2018 to 2020. 
it shows a comparison of all the years of our study. And as seen, there's a slight trend down from 2018 to 2020 on overall thickness. To find the sea ice extent, we put the files into QGIS. We then classified these files by adding in a training input in which we told the computer which files were sea ice and which points were not. The computer then classified the entire image. And as seen here, all ice is in green and red and sea ice is thin closer to the water. We also applied a mask for the land so that the ice here would not be considered sea ice. We took clear Landsat 8 visual imagery of Cape Washington collected from the United States Geological Survey to start our classification. We then imported the data into QGIS where we took land masks of the separate ice sheets and training inputs for all the classes. We then were able to report the yield surface area of ice for each month, which is located in the table below. In order to calculate the sea ice volume, we took the average height from each date from each month to calculate the volume based on the surface area that we uncovered in the previous classification. We figured out that the volume stays consistent relative to each other between the three years over the three months. However, there is no significant change from year to year, as well as uh, no prominent year to year trend, which is good because this doesn't show any dire changes in the sea ice volume. However, we did notice that the sea ice volume is declining during the late spring month of December, which is located in the graph to the right. The short intersection between ISAT-2's datasets as well as Cape Washington's population counts only gave us two years of joint data. Using ISAT-2's datasets, we predicted the penguin population for 2020 based on sea ice extent and volume. Below is listed a timeline of the data sets that we've used for our research. This graph visualizes Cape Washington's penguin population through the years. As we analyze this graph, during 2011, the lowest point of penguin population occurred with a total of 10,322 emperor penguins. As we further analyze this graph, during 2015, penguin population was at 24,997, but during 2017, there was a decrease of 12,525 emperor penguins. This directly correlates with the lowest time of sea ice thickness in recorded history of Antarctica. As we further analyze this graph, during 2018 to 2019, the penguin population started to decrease again. Some of the challenges we faced included visualizing Cape Washington sea ice through QGIS, as well as creating masks on the actual visual imagery itself. We also faced the challenge of interpreting the unprocessed data to account for any missing factors, including uh, figuring out and processing the data to optimize it with the best equation. For our study, we have concluded that there is a downwards trend in the sea ice extent, sea ice height, and sea ice volume from 2018 to 2020. We support the idea that emperor penguin population is strongly correlated to the amount of sea ice in the area. Our study provides critical context to understanding the risks that threaten these populations. As we further our research, we would like to expand our horizon, possibly researching towards the Northern Hemisphere and Greenland, as well as improved monitoring of sea ice extent for climate change. We would also like to analyze the movement of colonies over time. This research has proven to be beneficial due to its impact of setting the foundation of sea ice during a long period of time, especially how sea ice thickness affects penguin population. We studied Cape Washington where emperor penguins are at its highest. The scientists can use this research to find the optimal conditions where sea ice thickness as well as penguin population are at its highest. The SEAS internship has provided us with many new opportunities as well as will serve as a lifelong memory. The SEAS internship allowed us to meet 
new people from across the nation as well as conducting fun activities. For example, we made a mouse trap car or spray painting the solar system as well as listening to amazing and inspirational guest speakers. For example, we listened to past Apollo 13 astronaut Fred Hayes. In addition, we got to explore many new places, for example, like the Johnson Space Center, Six Flags, and a professional setting where we can conduct research. NASA Seas gave me the opportunity to connect with like-minded peers around the nation and develop my research skills. I am so, so thankful to be a part of NASA Seas and can't wait to utilize my skills in the future. The SEAS program is a great opportunity to find specialized application of remote sensing in my areas of interest. I've had a great time in this program and I've learned so much. The SEAS internship has served as a memorable experience along with the lifelong friends I've made. I'm so thankful to be given this opportunity and to broaden my horizons as well as focus on the subject I would like to study in college. We would like to extend our sincere appreciation to Dr. Christine Samurda for her support and guidance through the entire research process. We are extremely thankful for the lessons we've learned through this journey. We would like to extend a special thank you to NASA, the Center for Space and Research, the Texas Space Grant Consortium, and the SEAS program, as well as every single one of the mentors, administrators, Ms. Miller and Ms. Baggio and chaperones who helped us take part in this experience. Below, we have our sources that we've utilized during our research. And last, but certainly not least, is our mission patch for our sea ice group. Thank you all for listening.